introduce yourself in, in the chat box and just let us know um, let us know what your name is uh, let us know where you're you're from uh, where you're joining from so that we can welcome you It'd be great to, to know who's here hi Angela it's great to have you here you're super super early you were early all the days <laughs> so it's really great to have you um, Babs, it's great to have you here as well. Pam, it's great to have you here. Do, Mr. and Mrs. Do Kuro, it's great to have you here as well. Please just drop in the chat box where you're, you're watching from or where, where you're joining from. Um, it's, it's great to have every single person who, who is on um, at the moment. Wilcox Madifi from, from Nigeria, it's great to have you. Denise from North Carolina, it's lovely to have you as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you, um, everyone for joining. From Hamilton, wow, Canada, oh, thank you so much, pastors, um, Ian and Dad Taylor, you are here on the first day as well. It's great to have you. Um, and Bassi from Nigeria, it's great to have you as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Yesterday was absolutely amazing. I mean, it was through the roof. Uh, you know, my husband was sharing with us about the, the crazy cycle and the energizing cycle. That, that was, was absolutely great. And he said, you know, love is like oxygen to a woman, respect is like oxygen to a man. Um, but then if we're each waiting to see, you know, the other person should, you know, love me first before I respect or vice versa, then we enter into a whole crazy cycle. Um, you know, and then he was talking about the energizing cycle, how we can break out of the crazy cycle and enter into the energizing cycle so that our relationships and our marriages um, can work. So that, that was absolutely awesome. I was so blessed by that. Um, the day before um, yesterday, um, Pastor Paula Ayokala was sharing with us, she was talking about, um, you know, agape love and reciprocal love and how that, you know, we, we shouldn't just wait, you know, you know and, let, and, and wait for the other person to do before we do. Or, you know, talking about what the scripture says about, you know, agape love and just pouring out your love to the other person and doing it as unto Christ. And, you know, I really like this quote from her, love bigger than yourself. So go beyond yourself, go beyond what you can do in your own natural strength and just love, you know, love selflessly. It takes the grace of God. It takes the help of the Holy Spirit to do it because, you know, sometimes the other person may not be as lovable as you would like them to be. Um, but those are the times when agape love needs to rise up in our hearts. And, you know, we just pour out, uh, pour out our love. God helps us to love beyond ourselves. So I think I thought that was absolutely amazing. And then uh, Pastor Tunde also shared with us, he, he talked about a, a tale of two marriages. That was on the, the first day as well. And that was, was, Absolutely awesome. Um, one of the things that he said, he was talking about, you know, how that we need to be um, selfless in the way we approach our relationships. It can't be all about, you know, yourself. It, you know, you've got, because when self-preservation enters into a marriage, then love walks out of, of that marriage. So that's the bit that I, I got. I mean, I, mean, I, made, I made so many notes um, from all those sessions. So I was so, so blessed. I've been so blessed by everything. Today, it's going to be packed as well. Um, we really trust God that, you know, God is going to speak to us. Oh, this was from me. <laughs> this was from me yesterday, actually. Um, I was talking about you and your spouse, um, you know, and how that, you know, the person that you choose to marry and you yourself are the raw materials for the marriage that you will create. Um, I, I started off talking to, to the singles and sharing how important it is to be careful about the kind of person that you choose to get married to, because um, first of all, you need to make lots of investment in yourself so that you're in the best place and you're guarding your heart, taking care of your heart so you're in the best place to have the kind of relationship that God wants you to have. But once you've made that investment in yourself, then you've got to find someone who appreciates that investment and has also made a commensurate investment in, in themselves as well um, so that you don't put yourself in a position where uh, you know you're, you're the one that is pouring out but then the other person is not actually giving because ultimately it's you and the spouse that you choose to marry that will become the raw materials for the marriage that God will help you create so that was um, yesterday as well so in terms of what we're going to do um, today we've had our, for our poll um, this session is supposed to be really interactive, so we'd really like you to engage, engage in the, the chat box, um, you know, and if you've got questions, please, you know, do, do type your questions um, in the chat box, send them to me directly. Um, we're going to have awesome worship and music. Honestly, I don't know what to say about the worship sessions we've had in the last two days, um, but if you've not been here the last two days, you will experience some of that uh, shortly. Um, it's been absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, I've just like, enjoyed so much intimacy with God uh, through the worship, um, the ministry of um, Minister Shola Okunuga. It's been absolutely fantastic. We're going to have more of that today. Um, 
we're going to have a keynote message. We were scheduled to have two keynote messages today, as a matter of fact, uh, with one from Reverend Laurie Dahosa. But unfortunately, uh, she has had a bereavement this morning. Um, very sadly, she lost someone that's really very close to her. And in fact, it's the second bereavement that she's had this week. Um, you know, so it's really hit her you know, very hard. I'd just like us to take a moment uh, to pray for her and to pray for her family and for, for the ministry. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up to you, Reverend Laurie Dahosa. We lift up to you, her family. We lift up to you, the ministry. Father, Lord, they're hurting at this time uh, because of these two people that they have lost. Father, we ask that you will strengthen them, that you will encourage their hearts, oh God. Father, in this, this sort of season where it's, it's only you that can bring comfort, Lord, we ask that you bring comfort to their hearts and encourage them. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. So she sends her love, um, but you know she, she's not with us today. But we are delighted that we're having with us Pastor Michelle McKinney Hammond. I am so, so excited, honestly. She's such an amazing person. I was talking to her um, earlier today, you know, and uh, honestly, she has moved heaven and earth to be with us uh, today. She's an extremely busy person. She, she has another event after our event, actually, which is going on too. But she said, look, you know, I'll be there. You know, I'll spend the time with you and all that. So I'm really looking forward to her session. I'll introduce her properly later on. We're going to have a Q&A session. Um, so if you have any questions that are related to today's content that you would like to see addressed, then please send those questions uh, directly to me um, in the private chat so that it, you know, the questions don't get lost in the, in the chat box and then we'll, we will respond to the questions. Right, so um, if you're ready, um, if you're ready, just type in the chat box, I am ready. Without further ado, I have the pleasure to once again introduce an amazing music minister who has been with us, like I said, from the start of this event. It's been such a delight um, and, you know, and an honor to have him. Uh, for me, without a doubt, the worship sessions have been a, a major highlight of um, the time that we've had uh, together um, th these last two days. We're honored to receive the ministry of Shola Okunuga. Olorini Shola Okunuga is a seasoned, vibrant saxophonist and an awesome worship leader. Um, Shola, as he's sometimes called, has a personal goal to convey the genuine love of God through his sax to any audience. He is a distinguished musician who loves God and yearns to love God with his all. He's a self-taught saxopho saxophonist who believes in excellence and is always yearning to learn. He picked up the sax for the first time in 1998 and began his ministry in 2004 when he was blessed with a saxophone of his own. In 2010, he released his debut album, All I Have Is You, which was received as ca captivating and soul lifting, and I can understand why, promoting an atmosphere of intense worship and reverence to God. Shola has had the privilege to play on various national and international platforms and also alongside the likes of Dr. Ron Kenoli, Don Moen, Philippa Hanna, Muiwa Olari Waju, Ian White, Steph McLeod, Isabella, Bob Fitz, Chevelle Franklin, to mention a few. He's also played as the opening act for eight time Grammy Award winners, The Blind Boys of Alabama, and also with the award winning saxophonist um, Mike Aremu. Shola serves in his local church, RCCG Jesus House Aberdeen in, in Scotland, as a worship leader and saxophonist. He's happily married to the wife of his youth, Precious Okunuga, and they are blessed with two lovely daughters. Right, so join me, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome the ministry of Shola Okunuga. Good evening, everyone. It's good to be here tonight. Uh, it's been an awesome time in God's presence. I've been richly blessed from the sessions we've had in the past two days. And um, I was actually thinking about what was going to happen tonight. And in church today, it just hit me that um, God actually knows our name. And sometimes we get so busy in the hustle and bustle of life that we completely forget that he knows our name. And that his love for us is reckless you know god was saying in scriptures that um, a man had a hundred sheep and um, one got missing and um, he left the 99 to look for the one now i do not i'm not a preacher but the little mathematics i know is that if you leave one if you leave 99 to go and look for one that means that one is as valuable as the 99 put together. 
So for you to leave all the 99 to go and look for one, that means that one must be of great value. So to this evening, I'll be doing two songs. He Knows My Name and Reckless Love. I pray that as you listen, God will bless you. Amen. Thank you. 
Father, we're so grateful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your reckless love. Thank you for the way that you love us. Thank you, Lord, because you keep chasing after us, Lord. Our hearts are after you, oh God. We've not done anything to deserve your love, but you love us so much. We appreciate you. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise and glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to be going into the word session very shortly. Um, I'm so excited that Pastor Michelle is with us already. Um, and she's, she's, she's good to go. But I'm just going to share very quickly her, her bio. I mean, there's so much that can be said about her, but I'll just, just share a very quick um, bio about her. And then we'll go straight into the word. Michelle McKinney Hammond is the president of MMH Ministries. She's the best-selling author of over 40 books, selling over 2 million copies worldwide. A popular international speaker, vocalist, relationship expert, and lifestyle coach. She has spoken on major platforms ranging from T.D. Jake's The Potter's House to the Crystal Cathedral and Walmart Corporation. A former Emmy Award-winning co-host of the talk show Aspiring Women in the U.S., she also co-hosted TCT's 3D Woman Show. She has appeared on countless radio and television talk shows and been featured in magazines and newspapers in the US and abroad. Michelle is a featured spokesperson with her own segment on Roma Downey and Mark Bernard's Lightworkers.com and Light TV Network. She's an accomplished singer songwriter with seven CDs to her credit. Michelle is also an actress, appearing in several television series and movies in Ghana, West Africa. She is a visionary and pastor of Relevance, a unique music ministry based in Ghana. She continues to travel, speak, and perform internationally. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my singular privilege and honor to welcome Michelle McKinney Hammond. Right, so it's great, so great to have her. Let me just spotlight her. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you. Hello, you. everyone. Hi, my dear sister, Tommy. How are you doing? Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. I'm so glad I'm able to be with you. It's great to have you here as well. We're so delighted. I know you had to move so many things <laughs> to be here. Well, I'm set up so that I can, after I, I, I finish talking to you, I run and do praise and worship. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Great idea. Yeah. Praise God. Hello, Shola. Thank you for that wonderful, wonderful, you know, I love tenor. Believe it or not, I played tenor sax when I was in high school. But don't ask me to play now, okay? Because I would not do it as beautifully as you. <laughs> so it's still my favorite. So thank you for that. Oh, it was wonderful. Awesome. Okay, so we are talking about love for a lifetime. And of course, relationships is my very favorite topic. So anytime you ask me to talk about love, I am all in, okay? <laughs> and you know, the Bible tells us in uh, Philippians chapter one, nine, that we need to love intelligently. And let me pull that up because that's the one scripture I forgot to pull up for our talk, but um, I'm just taking my time here because it's an important topic, right? And so uh, we want to cover it well. And I like the fact that um, you are going at it from an all in attitude and not um, love for love's sake. So many people are in it for what they can get for the moment without really regarding the fact that we really are in it for a lifetime because lifetime is what covenant is all about. So I want us to approach this from when we're in it, we are in it forever. We're not in it until it stops being good. We're not in it until it's inconvenient. We're not in it until something more um, exciting comes along. We are in it for a lifetime. And so love doesn't just happen. Um, in Philippians chapter one, starting about verse nine, the message version, 
Paul is writing to the church. And I'm going to read the message version of this because I find it to be so profound. He says, this is my prayer for you, that your love would flourish and that you would not only love much, love well. That's actually my sign off now on all my letters. Uh, love much, love well, love always. Um, because, you know, we can love a lot, but not love well. And people have different interpretations of what love looks like based on their nurture. Their nurture becomes their nature. And that doesn't mean that it's necessarily good. And so here's Paul saying, don't just love much, love well. Learn to love appropriately, which means that there's inappropriate so-called love. As we know, there are different types of love, um, anywhere from four to eight, depending on which language you're looking at, some breaking down to a love for a brother, love for a friend, love for your mama, you know, I mean, they got a word for each stage of love. But he says, learn to love appropriately, which means that, you know, obsession is not appropriate. Jealousy is not appropriate. Um, controlling, manipulation is not appropriate. And yet some people do these things in the name of love. So he's saying, learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent. Wow, that's huge. That your love would be sincere, that it would come from a pure, clean, holy place and that it would also be intelligent, which suggests that we need to use our intellect. There are decisions that we make in love. When we look at um, God's type of love, it's not based on feelings. If it was based on feelings, he would have gotten rid of us a long time ago. God's love is based on his commitment to love us. He made a covenant with us that he cannot break, no matter how crazy we are, no matter how unlovable we are, he has committed to a covenant that he has made and therefore he does not break trust with that. So it is an intellectual decision to be committed to the commitment that we've made, okay? And then he goes on to tell us to live a lover's life, meaning that love is a lifestyle, okay? It's not a momentary moment. It's not a flash in the pan. It's not just when chemistry is, is um, boiling over in our systems. Love is a lifestyle. He says that we should do it circumspect, which means carefully thought out and exemplary, which means that it's blameless, that no one will be able to point a picture at a finger at you and say that, no, uh, you're not doing it right, or, oh, this person is being horrible or any of that. It really literally means that you are living a blameless and careful existence when you decide to love. Can you hear me well? I'm being accompanied by music. I, I didn't think it was gonna be this loud, but I'm hoping that my microphone is one directional. We can so hear can you, you hear Okay, praise God. It goes on to say that this lifestyle should be a life that Jesus himself would be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul. So literally love should be displaying all the fruit of the spirit, which is the very personality of God, kindness, patience, all of those things, self-control, self-control and love, that's huge, right? And all of these things will get others attracted to and involved in glorying in, in the glorification of God and praise to God, okay? So that being said, I wanted to just lay that as the foundation that when we love, love is bigger than our ideas of just emotional well-being, um, of feeling validated and affirmed, um, feeling that we now have an identity because someone wants to put their name on us. It's bigger than that. It's literally a lifestyle. It is something that requires intellect as well as emotion, okay? I remember years ago, my pastor in California telling me, Michelle, when you decide to get married, make sure that you like the person, you love the person, and you are in love with the person. Make sure that all three of these are in place. And I never forgot that. I think that that is a deep, profound, and very important piece of advice for anyone to adhere to when making decisions concerning love. Now, I believe that there are a couple of, of keys that help us to love for a lifetime. 
I know that I'm talking to singles as well as married people. And I'm, I'm going to say to the married people up front, if you're already in it, there are some decisions that you have to make to make it work out. And you will see those things as I go on. But for I'm going to start from the very beginning, okay, for those who still have a choice. And actually, this applies to married people too. Count the cost. Love is not free. It demands everything of you. I know J-Lo sang that song, Love is for Free. I'm sorry, J-Lo. I love her. I think she's gorgeous. But the song is wrong. Love costs you everything. It demands everything of you. It demands your all. It demands that you bring your best to the table. And it's not a 50-50 love, as one other song says. What was, who was that? I can hear him in my head singing. I'm talking 50-50 love. Nope, 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 not a 50-50 love. We're talking about 100%. Both people bring 100% to the table. And if each person is focused on making the other person feel loved and fulfilled, guess what? Both people will be loved and fulfilled, right? But if you're stopping to check to see if you're getting yours, that means that the flow has stopped in one direction and someone is being shorted in the game. So it says count the cost. So what are we getting into in the first place is what we need to ask ourselves. This is not just about peer pressure. I'm in this here, Africa, the pressure is on to get married at all costs. And I find that a lot of people get joined up with people and don't know why they're with them. Well, it's, it's, it was on my list. I had to get, I had to check the marriage box off. I had the pressure of auntie saying, hey, when are you getting married? And then, <laughs> That's it, right? And so we've got the we've got the marriage box, we've got the children box, we've got the finance box, but marriage should not be a box. The what you should have is getting to know the person as the box to see if they qualify to spend the rest of their life with you. You see, Luke 14, 28 tells us, is there anyone here who planning to build a new house doesn't first sit down and figure the cost so you'll know if you can complete it? So that means that you count the cost before you get married. And we're gonna talk about what the cost looks like in a minute. But if you only get the foundation, the word says, laid and then you run out of money, you're gonna look pretty foolish and everyone passing by will poke fun at you and say he started something he couldn't finish. So let us not start things that we cannot finish when it comes to covenant, when it comes to love, when it comes to marriage. So what do we need? What, what costs are we looking at? We're looking at uh, the cost of knowing what love is in the first place. Do we know what love looks like? I'm in a new show called Sankofa. I hope I said that right. I probably did not get told that every time I said that I said it wrong, but you know what I mean, right? <laughs> And, and the show is a relationship reality show where uh, myself, along with two other people, three other people, fix relationships. People come to us, they present a problem, and we dive in and fix it. But it is so interesting to me when we sit at that table and interview people that they have no idea why they're in the relations that they're, relationships that they're in. And most of them do not know what love looks like. So they've settled for something that's making them very unhappy, but feeling they have no other options. They're trying to fix the broken uh, teapot. Okay. So what I want us to know, first of all, is what is love? What are its characteristics? Are these things being exhibited in your exchange with this other person? See, love has a character. Love has a personality. So are we recognizing love? When we know the cost, then we know what's needed to help us make the right choices from us as well as the other person. Okay, so uh, we've gotten a great description of what love looks like in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It tells us that love is patient and kind. It tells us that it's not jealous or boastful or rude. It does not demand its own way. So many people sit at our table and say, well, this person's so controlling. Well, that is not an attribute of love. That's an attribute of a broken spirit and selfishness. So a decision has to be made. It says it is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. So that tells us the personality of what love is and what love is not so that we can measure it. When we meet someone, we need to go to this uh, description and say, is this person exhibiting these things? Are they exhibiting the fruit of the spirit, which is the personality of love itself? 
love is the personality of God. Are they looking like God to me? Not that they are God, but are they reflecting God, which is what glorifying God is all about. Glorifying God is simply this, is giving an accurate reflection of what God truly looks like. And your partner should be aiming for that. So the other thing is, do you know the job description of a partner? It seems that we don't even know what to expect anymore. And we end up settling for less than what God designed us to join ourselves to. The Bible is very explicit on the job description for a husband, that he is to love his wife sacrificially, wash them with the word and present them blameless before God, that they're supposed to take care of them. And if they don't, God won't even answer their prayers. Wow, that is huge. We don't talk about that a lot because we're too busy pounding the submission key key on the a keypad and uh but god has a bigger one that says hey if you don't treat her right i'm considering you an infidel and i won't answer your prayers so there is a job description for the husband he is uh, he is the protector he is your cover he is your it's it's not that he's your high priest jesus is the high priest but he becomes the other priest in your home washing you and presenting you faultless before god because you are well kept by his love you are the reflection of what Jesus's love looks like for the church. You are showing her that. And she, in response, as a representative of the church, submits to you because she feels loved and covered. Therefore, she can trust you and know that your intentions towards her are good. And she has no problem respecting you, being a team player, and cooperating with what you put forth in your home. That's really what submission is. It's submi a submission is cooperation. There's nothing passive about submission. Submission is an aggressive decision to cooperate with your partner. Sometimes you might have to cooperate when you don't quite agree. Sarah did. Sarah called Abraham Lord. And when he told her to lie, now I'm not telling you to lie. I believe that this is a descriptive story, not a prescriptive story in the word, but there's a principle there that she allowed him to be who he was and God stepped in, in the midst of his lapse. Okay. So that's why the Bible says to submit as unto the Lord, unless it's life-threatening, unless it's abusive. Okay. I mean, there, God does draw the line a couple of places, but for the most part, if it's just about the household and how things are run, those are things that you cooperatively submit to one another because the bottom line is that God calls us to submit to one another. However, both people in the relationship need to count the cost and say, do I admire this person? Do I respect uh, how they live their life, how they handle their finances, how they handle their emotions? Is this a person that I am willing to submit to? Decide that before you get in the union. Don't get the husband and then say, well, he's a fool. Well, you chose the fool. So now you got to submit to the fool, right? So make sure that you are saying yes to someone that you respect. You can see men, isn't it interesting that God tells the husband to love the wife, but doesn't tell the wife to love the husband? Because men read respect as love. Isn't that interesting? And women read love as love. As you giving yourself for her, that's love to her. Okay, so God knows the heart of us. He knows our DNA. He knows how he wired us and he gives instructions accordingly. So knowing the job description of a partner, can I live up to that job description? Is the person I'm considering able to live up to that job description? Okay, I've counted the, I've counted the cost. I know what love looks like. I know what the job description looks like. I am, I always say dating is not for mating, it's for collecting data. You know, so you're collecting your data and you're and you're seeing if it fits in with your love budget. Okay. Next element needed is the presence of God Himself. The word tells us that a threefold cord is not easily broken. I'm going to say in this instance that the threefold cord is not just two people and God. I believe the other threefold cord there is God, love, and skill. Okay, you've got to be able to work love, okay, or love will not 
work. The Bible tells us a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better than one because a triple braided cord is not easily broken. So let us look at what the triple cord looks like in the life of the person that we're looking at. There, because the materials that we want to build our house with are those that will be maintainable and sustainable. Amen. So we're looking at character. We're looking at a tech integrity. We're looking at their capacity to handle life, to handle challenges. We're looking at, um, are they disciplined? Do they show the fruit of the spirit? Are they patient? Do they have love at work? Are they joyous? Do they have peace in their life? Do they have an even temper? Um, are they kind? Are they good? Do they have a benevolent spirit? Are they faithful? And do they have self-control? These are materials that build the house of a person's character. And these are things that we must examine to see if they are longstanding, if they're sustainable and maintainable in our lives as we come together. And then check yourself. Do the check on yourself, you know, on a scale of one to 10. How patient are you? How peaceful are you? How joyful are you? How kind are you? How self-disciplined are you? How faithful are you? Because it's not just about what the other person brings to the party. It's about what you bring to the party of the marriage as well. We shouldn't torture people by expecting more from them than what we're able to give. These are things that make um, life, love, a lifetime affair. When there's an even exchange and both people are being filled to the full, fulfilled by the presence of the other person in their lives. They are better for knowing and being with that person than they are alone. I believe that the timing of when God presented Eve to Adam was when he decided that Adam would be better with a partner than without. You see, the thing is, is that God puts people together for purpose. We put, we put ourselves together for passion, but God puts us together for purpose, okay? Everything that God does, he is strategic. He's got a purpose for why he's doing it. He said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a help meet for him because he needed him to have help to carry out his assignment of having dominion, of subduing evil, of being fruitful and multiplying. These were things that God had given his charges to Adam, but Adam was not able to carry them out alone. Amen. So this is what we need to know. Now, the single people are saying, well, what if I'm single and this is still my assignment? Well, God will bring other people into your life to assist you in the various assignments that he gives you. He will never assign something to you that he does not empower and enable you and support you to do. Amen. So he has a way of providing whatever is needed to carry out the assignment in, in, that, in that hour. See, here it is again in Second Peter. Peter saying that make every effort to, re, to, to respond to God's promises by supplementing your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. Okay, moral excellence. He says, add to your faith virtue, if, if you know it in that translation. But virtue means excellence, okay? Not just the power of virtue that flowed out of the garment of Jesus. That's another type of virtue. But the other type of virtue, when it says who can find a virtuous woman, is talking about moral excellence. The word there is chakma, which means the art of, of, of living life excellently, okay? And then he says, add to the moral excellence some knowledge. So you're going to need to know what you're doing, okay? You can't be excellent without knowledge. And then he says, add to the knowledge, self-control. You see, when you know your why, self-control will kick in. An athlete is, is disciplined because he knows he wants to win the race. His why is soundly in place. So he knows what he's got to do to condition his body for excellence to be able to win the game. When we have knowledge, the thing that follows is self-control. And then it says with the self-control to add patient endurance. What it's saying here is that um, one, one um, translation says passionate patience. I like that. I like the fact that it's passionate patience because it means it's active patience. It doesn't mean that you're just sitting around folding your arms, just, you know, waiting and hoping and wishing. It means that you are anticipating 
that thing that you're waiting for, okay? There's an anticipation, there's a trust in God, and you know it's just about his timing and his moment of purpose that's gonna birth that thing. And so you're passionately waiting. You are waiting with patient endurance, okay? You can hang for a minute because you trust God to show up, unlike the foolish versions who weren't ready, right? I mean, some of them had planned ahead. You know, Roland Martin, the journalist from America came to Ghana to visit and he wanted to do a documentary of his visit to Ghana. When he came with these big trunks, we were like, Roland, what is all this stuff? Roland had about four drones. He had about, <laughs> how many cameras did he have taken? He had about six cameras. He had five phones. He had a hundred batteries. He had plugs galore. We said, what is all this? He says, I come prepared for anything. If something happens, I'm ready. And we were like, okay, this is a little bit ridiculous, but wouldn't you know that we got to Cape Coast and one of the things he was filming was a canoe ride. And he fell out of the boat and lost the phone. One of the cameras went in the water, got waterlogged and the, and the drone was killed, but he still had backup and nothing stopped his show. <laughs> when you're patiently enduring, you are prepared for everything, okay? You are not like the foolish virgins who you know fell asleep, got tired of waiting. And by the time the groomsmen showed up, they had run out of oil and, and lost their place at the wedding feast. That's not what we're aiming for. We're aiming for patient endurance that's equipped for the wait in, in passionate expectation of what God is going to do in our lives and in our relationships. Then it says to add to the patient endurance, godliness. So literally what that does is it keeps us in a place of holiness. When we're trusting God completely and we've got faith, we know that God will meet us on the other side of our obedience. And so we come into perfect alignment with his word, which is godliness. And that godliness leads us to be able to have, uh, to give um, affection freely, okay? And to love everyone the brethren in the church and, and those without that don't know God. And he says that the more that we grow like that, the more productive and useful we will be in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of these things are things that we're looking at in the character of the other person and checking ourselves as well on a scale of one to 10. How high is your faith? How, you know, how virtuous are you? How, how, you know, where are you in moral excellence? Where are you in knowledge of why God says what he says? Uh, where are you when it comes to self-control? Where are you when it comes to patient endurance and godliness and exhibiting love for the brethren? Where are you? How productive and useful are you? You know, I always say when you meet people, you should ask them, don't ask them, are they a Christian? Ask them, how's your relationship? Tell me about your relationship with the Lord. Because then you get to hear if they're really intimate with God or if they're just religious. If they tell you they go to church, you go, oh, okay. So you just know Jesus' cousin. I want to know, do you really know Jesus? What does that relationship look like? Because it's going to bear weight on the relationship they have with you. Their capacity to love you will only go as deep as their love for God. Simple. Now, the other thing that has to happen in order for us to have the love of a lifetime is we need to know why, why? Why are we in it? When I counsel couples that are falling apart, I always ask them, tell me how you got together in the first place. And as they begin to talk about how they met and how they fell in love, their whole countenance changes, the atmosphere in the room changes because they've returned back to their first love. They remember why they got together in the first place. The, what, the Bible says that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him of accomplishing his goal to win us to himself, to redeem us for himself, that he endured the cross. There's some things that you're going to have to work through in relationships. But if you know your why, you will endure. Amen. Again, I exempt abuse. Again, I exempt abandonment. Okay, um, because these are not the heart of God. That's not love and action. So I, I have to keep saying that. Um, he not only endured the cross, he despised the shame. He despised what other people thought. He wasn't worried about what social media said about him. He wasn't worried about looking like a fool. He had a why, and he knew that he had to die for his why. 
And when we're in relationships, we have to die. You know, my friends laugh at me because I always accidentally call weddings funerals and I call funerals weddings. I have to catch myself. Oh, you going to the funeral? I mean the wedding. <laughs> And I think that because instinctively in my spirit, I know that in order to really make that marriage work, you have got to die. No longer I, but Christ in me. No longer I, I am now joining myself. I am taking this person's name and the two are becoming one. It doesn't happen at the altar. It is a process. It is something that you're walking out and walking towards um, daily, as long as you're with that person. I love it when you finally see um, old couples. Old couples are so cute, aren't they? They even start looking alike. They can finish each other's sentences. They know what the other person is thinking. They've got all kinds of eyeball language. They don't even have to talk anymore. Just look at you. And the person knows what they're thinking, right? They could be across the room and go, and they say, oh, I, I, I got to go. They ready to go. Why? They have become one. They have left and cleaved, okay? For this reason shall a man leave his his mother and father and cleave to his wife and the two shall become, become, become one. They are in um, uh, perpetual becoming. And the older they get, the more one they become, amen? That's why you'll even notice that a lot of old couples, if one of them dies, the other one follows shortly thereafter because they're so bound together in the spirit right so their mind is already on the other side with that person and they just follow physically after a while so know your why be willing to do the work right um you know i think that we think that love just happens by osmosis it does not You've got to learn that person's language. You've got to learn that person's love language. You need to know what the love languages are. You need to know how they express love, what their idea of love is, so that you begin to speak their language and live their language, okay? Um, my mentor said to me once that when she married Frank, her husband, that she learned to speak Franklish. <laughs> okay? And so she knew what he liked. She knew what made him feel loved. And, you know, go ahead and ask your partner, what makes you feel loved? Notice what they love to do for you. That's usually what their love language is. Is it acts of service? Is it touch? Is it quality time? You know, all of these different types of things. And the other thing that's important to know, too, is the temperament of the person. Um, because most of the time, opposites do attract. Sanguines end up with melancholies or sanguines end up with phlegmatics. Oh my goodness. And then it's just like, they're always like, oh, but they actually need one another. And when we celebrate the strengths of what the other temperament is in our lives, it brings balance to our life. So these are the things that we need to really look at when we're talking about building love for a lifetime. And it's important to do the work of even studying. You know, um, Tommy, recently I started a love university um, and I do classes on that because I realized we study for every career in life except the most important one, which is relationships. And when we go to church, they don't really talk about that. They're, you know, trying to get you into a house and get you a new car, whatever they're doing. You know, um, but they don't teach you how to do life and love in practical ways that make your relationship work. And so what happens is we learn about love from observation. And sometimes our observation is not an accurate reflection of what God sees as love. So we have to do our homework. We've got to dig into the word, study God's character, see how he loves on us, how he loves others and model that. Um, and then we have to study what his definitions of love are. As I said, I gave you those scriptures. Based on the fruit of the spirit and the definition of love, we have to now revisit, are we exhibiting these things to our partner? Is our potential partner exhibiting those things? If we're dating, we're dating to determine if this person is worthy of consideration for courtship, okay? And, um, and in that courtship, the, the verdict is still out because now you're just um, focusing to see what it looks like if you decide to come together. You're making one another a priority during that time and learning more about each other uh, to then come to a verdict of if you should move forward to commitment. 
But once that commitment is made, it is important to know that you must remain committed to your commitment. That is what true covenant is. It's not based on feelings. It's based on commitment. You know, even when um, a God made a promise to David that the throne would never depart from his house. Now, everyone that sat on the throne after David was not a good king. But because of God's promise and commitment and covenant, he could not wipe them off the throne. He had to allow the circumstances of life to do that. And so as we look at, at love and expecting love to endure, we have to know that um, we can't go into the relationship planning, well, if I don't like this and I don't like that, I can get out. I believe that you know economics has made it easier for people to get out. And so they don't put up with as much as they used to back in the day when you know you didn't have a choice and an option you had to make it work and perhaps that's why scientifically arranged marriages work better too but arranged marriages are made on people's commonalities and that's the other thing that i always like to bring up what do you value what do you believe be very clear about those things so that when you're talking with someone, you're finding out that their values are in alignment with you. The word says, how can two walk together except they be in agreement? And so there has to be a foundation of understanding and agreement on basic issues. You don't have to be alike. That's not what I'm saying. If both of you are alike, one of you is unnecessary. And God is going to put you together to rub you. He says, as iron as rubs against iron, so two friends sharpen one another. So that is in place that God isn't going to make it so easy. He's not going to let it be um, something that that person will not feel and be your all in all. Because there's a God-sized space that only God can fill. But in the meantime, he does put us together to refine us even more by our union. And once we understand that, we're not so busy pointing at the other person and saying, this person's, you know, really wrecking my world. No, you stop and you're asking God a different question. God, what are you trying to refine in me as I deal with this situation with my partner? How do you want me to shift? How do you want me to change? Um, how do you want me to adjust? How do you want my character to grow um, and, and flourish in this situation? And as we submit ourselves to the circumstances and the people that God puts in our lives to refine us, we become better people. We reflect the glory of God in a greater capacity because of what God is doing in us, through us, and through the other person in our life. So as we um, think about marriage for the final thing that I wanna say before I open up for questions, know that marriage has a specific purpose. Marriage is to reflect the kingdom of God. It is to reflect the union of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. It is to give a glimpse of heaven on earth to others so that they want to come into the kingdom. As we show our love to one another, people want that love. They hunger and thirst for the righteousness and the love that we exhibit, and it adds to the kingdom of God. We become power teams, okay? And you know, Power teams know their positions, right? They're not quibbling about submission and who gets the ball. No. If you look at soccer, basketball, football, the team members are all very clear on their position. And their, their positions are given to them according to their strengths and what they bring to the game. So that collectively, when everyone stays in their position and performs well in their position, the team wins the game. And that's what we want to do in marriage. We want to win the game. And we win the game when we collectively, um, you know, assert one another's strengths and weaknesses. You know, perhaps, I, I believe that the best marriages are not stereotypical marriages. They're, they're not going according to what the world says each gender does. They decide what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and they reassign tasks based on that so that they can win at the game of life in their house. Every man doesn't have to do finances. He might not be good with numbers. It might be that the woman is better with numbers. She might be more resourceful with that. And so he'd say, honey, you do the bills. Now, she might not be the greatest cook. He might be a fabulous cook. So honey, how about we switch? You do the cooking. And he loves cooking, so he says, cool. You see, so I think that a household has to, 
decide what they're doing based on their preferences, their strengths, and what works for them individually, and not allow themselves to be bullied by stereotypes from the outside world. These are the things, love, understanding, commitment, communication. <clears throat> you know, in Song of Songs, he said, show me your face and let me hear your voice for your face is lovely to look upon and your voice is sweet. Catch the little foxes that ruin the vine because uh, the grapes are in bloom and they're tender, talking about love. And so he was saying, let us talk, let us exchange, come, let us reason together. Though your sin be a scarlet, I will make you white as snow. Do you know that two partners are supposed to be washing one another? That when a fence comes into the midst of them, that they're washing one another. They're not waiting for the other person to clean up their act alone. They're saying, let me help you. Let me help you wash that stain off your heart, off your spirit. And so it is a combination of all of these things that causes love to last, the commitment to our commitment. Communication, transparency, accountability, the fruit of the spirit and the presence of God in the center of it all. Every decision should be weighed in light of how would God feel about what I'm doing? How would God feel about how I'm treating my partner? How would God feel about how I'm behaving myself right now? These are the things that when we take them into consideration and make love a lifestyle based on God's preferences, we will have love for a lifetime. Jesus walked in favor with God and got it from man because he was in right alignment. And anything that pleases God is gonna be automatically acceptable to men around us. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, we can do some Q and A. I hope that I gave you a lot to think about. Wow, 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 honestly. That's absolutely amazing. I'm taking so many notes, so many notes. <laughs> I'm just going to say a few things uh, from my notes and we'll, we'll have a brief um, session of worship um, while people are sending, sending in their, their questions. So I've got here, count the cost. Love is not free. That hit me like a, a you know, like a 10 ton truck. That is absolutely true. You've got to count the cost, um, you know, before you actually step into that whole relationship or, you know, marriage thing. Um, mm -hmm. You've also said that, God puts people together for purpose, but we put yes. ourselves together for passion. I said, amen to that. <laughs> amen to that. Because, you know, a lot of the time we're just thinking about, you know, our emotions, the way we feel and all that. Yes. Um, you know, but like you rightly pointed out, God started off from giving Adam, you know, an assignment. First of all, he had a purpose yes. before, you know, Eve came into his life. So that is so crucial. So mm -hmm. crucial. Um, another one, a person's capacity to love you will only go as deep as their love for God. I'm stealing that one and I'm going to post it on social media. <laughs> that, is powerful. that is powerful. And then to make marriage work, you have to die. You have to die. I you mean, have to die. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are too many married people still living as single people and it causes a problem. Hmm. Mm, mm, absolutely mm. absolutely wow that was absolutely amazing can you please send your questions directly to me in the chat box um minister shola okunuga is going to take us you know in a bit of worship for a few minutes while you send your questions to me there are a few that have come in already um but please keep sending your questions in we're going to have a good time <laughs> within the q and a session um so we've got a bit, a bit of time to do that but over to you minister shola Amen. Good evening once again. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Uh, Pastor Mitchell, that was amazing. I mean, that was wow. That's, I just, that's all I can just say. Wow. As in that was like, mm, man, deep, very deep. God bless you. Thank you so, so, so much. I got a lot of things I've written down and I'm going to be posting them and I'm going to be tagging you so that um, Praise I God. <laughs> I don't have any copyright issues. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the things I've learned so far is that um, there's a song we normally sing in church that I personally think is a love song and um, I like the song. 
and I like to play at couples events. Wonderful. I'll be doing that song just now before we go into the Q&A session. And the song is by Dr. Ron Canoli. It says, you are the love of my life. Wow, that's my favorite song. Oh, really? Okay. I actually got to sing that song with Ron Canoli at the stadium in Ghana. Wow. Really? Wow. <laughs> yes, I got to do the duet with him. Awesome. Okay. I got to play it right now because... Yeah, you better play it right, baby, because I'm going to sing along. <laughs> All right, so I'll be doing that shortly, uh, and I pray that it blesses you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus.
That was awesome, awesome. <laughs> the Lord bless you, Minister Shola. Thank you so much. That blessed me so much, so much. Man, thank you very much. So, Pastor Mitchell, I hope I did a little justice to the song. <laughs> Wonderful, loved it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Praise God. Right, so we're going to be going into the Q and A session now. Um, I've had a few questions that have come through. First one says, please ask Pastor Michelle her take on feminism and its effect on marriages. Uh, one of my favorite questions. Well, you know, feminism in and of itself is not a bad word in its original intent. But just as God created everything with an original intent and the enemy has perverted it, that has really been perverted in the world as well. Um, I always ask feminists, if we're not dealing with, you know, the basic topics of equal pay and all of that, what are we doing? And I don't even know if the word is something that should be at the table of a Christian woman, because it is a worldly concept. It is not a Christian concept. Um, it's not what God has deemed. God, you know, what, let me, oh, oh, Holy Spirit, glory. Mm, I've never heard it put this way before until right now. This is the original sin of what happened in the garden when the snake told Eve, God just wants you to, uh, you know, he doesn't want you to be like him. And Eve, the young strand, literal translation says that the serpent deceived me and I forgot when God asked her what she had done. What was the deception? What did she forget? She forgot who she was. She forgot she was already like God. God had said, come, let us make man in our image. That did not exempt the woman. The woman was already resident inside of the man. The woman was not God's second thought. He was there from the beginning. He said, created he them, male and female, when he said, let us make mankind in our image. We get hung up on King James um, language and don't see the big picture of what God is doing there. So we don't need feminism. We're already like God. We're already equal. We're already strong. We're already um, valued and affirmed by God. And if we walk in the knowledge of that, others have to bow to that. But if we don't have the knowledge of that, if we don't know who we are, then we allow other people to name us and frame us. But walking in the knowledge of who God created us to be, we're already empowered. We're empowered by the spirit of God to be who he called and created us to be in our homes, in society, in the boardroom, no matter where we are. And the bottom line is, is that a woman is powerful in whatever her capacity is, whether she's a housewife, whether she's the president of a bank. Because let me tell you, more wars have been won by pillow talk than women sitting at the table. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, Pontius Pilate didn't kill Jesus because his wife had a dream. She wasn't at the table. Mm. Mm. Esther saved a nation over dinner. She wasn't at the table. She was, she was in place to be an influence to the man that God had assigned her to be for a purpose. Wow. God looked down through the annals of history and saw that it was going to have to be a Jewish woman by the side of a heathen king to save the nation of Israel at some point. And he actually displaced another woman, Bashti, and put her in place for that moment in time. And if every woman could see that marriage is not just about their personal desire, but it's actually a literal assignment that is made to impact the man, to, to impact the home, to impact the neighborhood, the community, wherever she's placed, she will walk in that power without feeling that she's got to grow hair on her chest to exhibit it. Mm, wow. <laughs> so that's Mike what I think about feminism. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Absolutely. I mean, what more is there to say to that? I completely agree with you. When you know who you are, you don't yeah. need feminism. That's the bottom line. Exactly. Of you don't. You don't. Exactly. Wow. You know, when we're excellent in what we do, people will always pay for it. We'll always have to bow to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where the focus needs to be, not in recognition. The Bible says your gift will make room for you. Mm. So make your gift a gift that, that people want. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Wow, I love that. I love that. Okay. Next question. Someone says, I also agree with doing what works for you in your home. But what does Titus 2.5 mean by women being keepers at home? It means exactly that. That doesn't mean that um, it's, there's no specific job assignment with that. It's just saying that a woman sets the atmosphere in her house, whether she's cooking, whether she's taking care of the bills, whether she's a mother, whether um, she's a business person, she literally sets the atmosphere. And so um, that is the nurturing quality of a woman. A woman has gifts that are inherent in her that the man does not possess. Um, he, the gift of influence and intuition belong to a woman. Those are not gifts that a man has. And so he needs her to see certain things, to be resourceful in certain areas that he cannot be. And that's what it means by being a keeper at home. Hallelujah, awesome. <laughs> Excellent, thanks for that. Um, this one is a bit of a long one, so I'm going to read it. It says, if God puts us together for purpose, like you mentioned in your message, how should that influence our choice for a spouse? I mean, does that mean that we necessarily need to be similar in mindset, personality, and interests? Um, where really should the similarities be uncompromised? So for instance, I'm an artist, and as a creative, there's largely a different approach to how I view life and things generally, so I tend to be unconventional. And sometimes I've found my uniqueness play out differently for me with regard to settling down. I wonder if that means that I should be looking for another creative like me. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Like I said, if both of you are alike, one of you is unnecessary. But what we're talking about here is values and standards. Mm -hmm. What are your values? Your values and standards should be in alignment, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, personalities can be different. Um, how you um, process things can be different. As long as you respect uh, the way that the two of you function and you're able to celebrate it and see the plus in it for you. Um, you know, some people are very different. Uh, you, you usually find a talkative person with a quiet one. Well, they can't both talk at the same time. So there's a balance that happens there. So um, it's not necessarily that you need another creative. You just need someone who appreciates your creativity, but also brings the business in that you will need to balance you mm, mm, absolutely absolutely <laughs> right so you need that balance yes. yes absolutely that's great so don't go marrying someone who's creative <laughs> <laughs> yes you probably need someone to to organize you a little bit mm -hmm. absolutely agree um I, I think that's the reason why opposites tend to attract because yes. you find in the other person's strengths which you you lack in yourself and then the two of you are better together than you would have been apart so exactly uh, i think that's that's the way that god designed it great um i've got another one here it says while we learn to love our partner in other words find their love language we might not be quickly accurate so i try to give my best but i feel that he demands extra attention and i'm not aware of it um, especially when we are around, we're surrounded by other people. He has said mean things to me, for example, that I'm not following what we are learning in this course. And after he acts, um, and after that, he acts lovely out of regret. Um, on one hand, I see that he has um, self-control in some things and not in others. What do you recommend? Um, or how can we fast yeah. discover what a partner needs and stop hurting their ego. It's quite a compound question. Well, <laughs> I, well, I would say stop guessing. I would ask direct questions and then observe as well. People mm -hmm. do what they want. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that is another way of, of, of learning what your partner's needs are. But, you know, I always feel that there's a business component to marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, married uh, businesses, when they aren't doing well, or even when they are doing well, have annual meetings to assess where they are. Are they hitting their goals? What needs to happen in order for them to reach those goals? Um, you know, what are their mutual um, um, goals? What, what do they want to press forward towards together? Mm -hmm. And if it's even, you know, I mean, and everything should be discussed in that meeting. Sex, how you communicate with one another, you know, the food you like, do you want to lose weight? Do you want to work out together? Whatever. I think sometimes we take ourselves so seriously that we don't, um, we're not transparent. We're not willing to be transparent and accountable to our partner. And yet they are your partner. Don't forget that. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted to work too. So let's find out 
how it's going to work best. Um, you know, you can ask, how am I doing? Give me an assessment. Maybe we can get a little grade sheet going, you know. Um, do you feel I pay enough attention to you? Why? Why not? What would make you feel like you were getting the attention you want? Um, and why do you feel it's necessary to talk mean to me in front of other people? Uh, it really hurts me. Don't do the you thing. Mm -hmm. Say, did you mean it when you said so-and-so? Because it really made me feel this way. Give that person the opportunity to be empowered to help you. You mm -hmm. see? So sometimes we need to empower people to do the right thing. Absolutely, absolutely. So just ask and stop guessing, basically. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Um, I've got another question here. If you still got questions, um, please send them through. Okay, I've seen there, there are a couple more. Um, uh, here's a good one. When one is dating, how would you be able to tell when one is being honest and not pretending? Well, my mentor, I always used to say, patience is the tool that uncovers deceit. Watch mm. and wait. You know, they say watch and pray, watch and wait, watch and watch, okay? Uh, wait and watch. Um, you know, don't be in such a, a, a hurry. And also listen to stories around you. Observe friends, observe family. All of them give you clues as to the reality of who that person really is. Mm -hmm. Listen to their conversations. What are they talking about the most? Those are the things that are furthermost on their heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. How do they treat um, people at the restaurant when you go out? Um, you know, all of these types of little things give you clues. Sometimes we it tend to uh, ignore red flags and hope for the best. But all of these things are things that we are watching and looking at to make a clear assessment on who this person really is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. As you say, dating is for collecting data. Yes. <laughs> it's not for mating. Right. So I've got one more question here. Okay. Um, if you've still got questions, please send them through. It says, I got divorced six years ago and I learned my lessons from the divorce. I'm now ready mm -hmm. for a relationship that should lead to marriage. But the men that come my way are not God-fearing, even though they have other fantastic qualities that every woman would want in a man. These men go to church, worship God and all. But the reason I say they are not God-fearing is that they still tell small lies here and there. For example, I met someone recently and the same situation is playing out. When we are somewhere and his phone rings, he tells the caller that he's driving, whereas he's not driving. And I'm not okay with such lies. Um, I mm -hmm. feel I cannot be with a man that lies. I want yeah. someone who would love God to the extent of taking little things seriously. Am I too selective? I want to choose right this time and I'm very cautious. My friends say nobody's perfect and hence they think that if I continue like this, I may end up not remarrying. Please advise. Well, you know, the worst lie we can ever believe is that we don't have options. We always have options. And I think that you're doing your homework and you're doing your homework well. Um, there is someone. You're just not meeting that person today. That's all. Yeah. Um, those are standards. When you're talking about godly character, that is a standard that is non-negotiable. Um, and since you said you learned from your last um, I'm sure that um, a godly man is even more important to you because you know what can happen when someone compromises. Oh, we're all a little flawed and we might not get it right on every given day, but uh, there are some things. Lying is unacceptable. I mean, that one is just, ooh, that leads to so much stuff and opens the door for so many things. Mm -hmm. So I don't think so. And, and let me put it to you this way. I always say I can do bad all by myself. Why would I want to be joined to somebody to do bad? That's just, that's just double trouble. Absolutely. You can pay for peace. So, you know, for me, it's always, you know, about um, where's my most peaceful state? Mm. Mm. And I don't move past peace. Mm. Mm. I like that. Mm -hmm. mm. I like that. Where is my most peaceful state? And I don't move past peace. Absolutely. Yeah. That's powerful. That's powerful. Wow. Um. There's another one here that says there's there are so many terrible there's so much terrible marriage counseling by the church and crisis management <laughs> is really terrible <laughs> where issues are pushed under the carpet. How do you help women, especially when they're facing these pressures from the church? 
Well, I mean, that's why I established Love University. You mm-hmm. know, I think I have another semester starting at the end of uh, of September. So people can go on my website and see that. I have several different programs that uh, Love Capsules um, is a subscription program where they get information three times a week. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, little doses, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but I think that we each do our part and, and the church can't do it all. Um, and so, you know, really finding information. Um, there are a couple of people that are really great about relationship topics. Uh, Pastor Kingsley, uh, Darius Daniels, um, a couple of other people. I'm, I can't think of them right now off the top of my head, but those are two that come to mind, um, you know, of just doing the work, doing the research, reading those love, those books on love languages, uh, Gary Smalley, um, John Trent, um, trying to think of the other one. Uh, the, uh, yeah, my books, I've got 42 books on relationships. <laughs> um, but also, um, you know, there's um, boundaries. Some people need to know about boundaries. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you know, uh, temperaments. If, temperaments, I believe that two of the most important things that you can research are the books on temperament mm-hmm. and love languages because they just give you such a great view of how to understand your mate. And it helps you. So that you don't think you're crazy. <laughs> okay, this person's doing this because that's how they are. <laughs> yeah, I can deal with that now. I can now adjust myself. Mm-hmm. That's right. Right, we've got two more questions and we're going to close it there. Um, one of them okay. is sort of like on the back of this, this last one. It says, how do we deal with marriage counseling from the local church that may be more cultural than word-based? Well, we've got to recognize culture for culture and know that God transcends culture. Mm-hmm. God's word is the final word and measurement on everything. And so we're not ruled by culture. We're not ruled by tradition. We're not even ruled by habits and generational, you know, um, things that we've seen in our, in, our, in our lives. You know, a lot of people want to blame um, generational curses on generational habits, mm-hmm you know, um, copying behavior that's become our normal because of what we've observed, our nurture becomes our nature. So it's very, very important that um, we understand the difference and always refer back to the word of God and do what he tells us to do to conduct ourselves. Absolutely. And then last one, it says, what is the key message for single people who are struggling with an aching womb with aching womb syndrome. So that's to say their biological clock is ticking and they really would like to have children in a godly way. Well, I would like to say that if you have the spirit of motherhood or fatherhood that you will, um, you will adopt, you will foster, you will love children that are available to be loved in your world right now. There are a lot of people birthing babies that are not mothers and not fathers. So that's not what motherhood is. That's not what fatherhood is. And so if you're truly a mother, you will nurture those available to be nurtured. I believe that God might be keeping some of us from having babies um, just so that we'll love the ones that are here that don't have someone to love them. And when we move past ourselves, Um, you know, and see what God wants to do in his economy when it comes to motherhood and fatherhood, then we will be happy and fulfilled and be um, a tool in someone else's life. Amen. Amen. (laughs) So that's perfect time. Thank you so very much, Pastor Michelle. We're so grateful to have you. you This is the love of my life here. (laughs) God bless you. Thank you for having me. We appreciate you. Thank you very much. I'm most delighted to have you. And so thank you so very much. And I mean, thank you. God bless. (laughs) We're honored. God bless you. Thank you very much indeed. (laughs) Right. So hand you over to my sweetheart for some final words. um, And then he will take us in a a closing, closing prayer. Wow, what an amazing evening it has been. This has been a crescendo of the three-day power packs. I will call it um, unshakable married masterclass we have had. It's been an immersion. I would want to say thank you, everyone, for being on this platform. We are glad you came first day, second day, and the third day, or if you just joined in today. So we're so delighted, so, so delighted. And I believe that we have received quite a lot in this period. It's my prayer. It's my personal conviction that God is going to go with you. 
is going to fulfill your deepest desires in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Also strongly believe Ephesians 3.20 is going to happen for you. Mm -hmm. God is able, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ever think, dream, or imagine according to the power that is at work within you. So watch out for what's going to be happening in your future, whether you're single or married, you are moving into a season of, of, of new things that will be happening to you, through you and for you. Let's all go and become vanguard for great marriages wherever we are. Mm -hmm. Examples wherever we go. And I believe we will become catalysts wherever we go to, to for great marriages to happen. So thank you, thank you, thank you. But before we go, let's say thank you again to, uh, to Minister Shola. Oh, oh Konoga, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful, wonderful time. Let's put our hands together, whether you can just clap. I heaven, heaven will register that. So we're grateful. Uh, thank you to your family too uh, for, for releasing you to be here. And so thank you so very much to our wonderful team. Um, uh, uh, Sister Pamela, Sister Dorothy, Sister Tayo and all of the people working in the background to make this happen. So thank you so very much. It's such a wonderful thing to be able to have all of you as a team to be here. We could not have done all this without you. So thank you for coming together with us to see that God's agenda is fulfilled. God puts people together to fulfill his purpose. And so you all are here to make that happen. And of course, a wonderful, wonderful, uh, Appreciation to my wonderful darling, my wonderful sweetheart. <laughs> uh, I mean, you have driven this thing so, so, so heavily, and uh, I'm, I'm so delighted to to see these things happening. Of course, you've become everything: an engineer, a computer person, a designer, a graphic artist, the organizer, and everything. So, so I mean, it's so ambidextrous in in every way. So multi talented. I'm pulling all this stuff out to make this happen. The great God of heaven will keep his oil fresh to continue to flow over your life in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. And to all of our wonderful audience across the globe from Nigeria to the United States to, uh, to Bermuda to, you know, wherever you're logging on in from. So we're just so, so grateful to have you on this platform, South Africa, um, South Carolina, you know, Canada, everywhere. We are grateful. And please watch out this space because a lot is going to be happening uh, mm -hmm. online. Um, Tommy Talks, Marriage Masterclass, and all of the all of the platforms. Make sure you do log on. Uh, we also do other things. Also, well, I'm 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 on podcast. I do a lot of podcasts weekly, which is around you know startups, productivity, career, and all of those. Mm -hmm. what for Over the Line podcast with Martin Stolohi and all of the other things we do. And some of our uh, church audience also are here. So thank you so very much, Catalyst Church Global. We, we, we are grateful to have you here. God bless you all. I'll hand you over. Uh, are, are we closing at this point? Would you like to say a word before we go? Please. Uh, well, just a word of prayer. But, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to everyone. <laughs> so please, please go ahead. Yeah, so, so thank you all for, for joining. It's been, it's been awesome. Uh, it's been absolutely fantastic uh, have, having you all um, with us today. Like my husband has said, just watch out for all the other things that we're doing online. Um, I'd like to encourage you, please keep um, Reverend Lori Dahosa in, in, in your prayers. Um, obviously, as for those that joined late, uh, she's been bereaved and that's why she couldn't join us um, today. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, it's been a great time. Um, we get to close earlier today, so you can go on and enjoy the rest of your evening. So we're going to have a, a short closing prayer, and that will be it. Yes, so, so let's pray. Father, we're grateful, and we thank you. Thank you for pulling us all together. You beckon to each and every one of us to come, and here we are at your altar. Lord, we thank you for the open heavens upon each and every one of us. Lord, I ask that the grace that makes things easy and makes and brings out the joy of marriage, we follow every single one here present in Jesus' name. But mm -hmm. fulfill your purpose and your counsel. You said, you know the plans and the purpose you have for us, the plans of good, not of evil, to bring us to a hope and a future. 
I decree and I pray that these purpose and these plans will be fulfilled to the letter. Yeah. Lord, you said, blessed is she that believe, for there shall be a performance of those things told her of the Lord. We believe, and so we receive all you have planned for each and every one of us. Joy, peace, um, completeness, nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing lacking. Yeah. This will be the portion of your people spiritually, mentally, financially, in the marriages, in all of the spheres of our lives. This we pray in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, joining us and coming on. Thank you all. God bless you. God bless you. Bye. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'd say thank you. You've learned so much in the last three days. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you all for joining.